Welcome viewers and listeners to CHP Talks. I'm here with another exciting guest uh, this week. It's Mr. Ken Stouffer from Alliston, Ontario. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rod. Great to be here. Yeah. For those who don't know, Ken has recently become the National Development Director for the Christian Heritage Party of Canada. He served one year as our deputy leader, and uh, now he's in this new role and reaching out so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Ken's background. He's been interested in politics since his university days when he studied political science at the University of Toronto. He's been involved with the Federal Conservative Party in years past. He served for a number of years as a director in local riding associations. He's done a good deal of the, the hard work of campaigning, putting up signs, knocking on doors, and phoning supporters at election time to get out the vote. His experience in business, he had five years selling life insurance, and then over 30 years recruiting people for professional and management roles in businesses like Maple Leaf Foods, Walmart, IBM, Honda, and so on. Now that's given him a good understanding and appreciation of the business world. He's been recruiting on a self-employed basis for the past 13 years, and he's now based in Alliston, Ontario. All of his work in his career has been very people intensive and sales oriented, which of course is the root and branch of political work. Uh, recently he stepped away from his recruiting career to, to take on this new role of development director for the Christian Heritage Party. And he says it's because this crisis that we are in as a nation, uh, that we've drifted away from God and he sees the only solution is for our nation, our people to turn back to God and the only political party pointing us back to God is the CHP. Uh, he says, we desperately need conservative voices in Ottawa who are firmly rooted in the values that made Canada strong and free. We're gonna talk about that a bit uh, in our interview today. People who aren't muzzled by party political correctness. He says that the CHP is giving us the opportunity to inform the people of our country about our amazing Christian heritage and to help them understand that the CHP is the only party anchored in the biblical principles that created Western civilization and made Canada free and prosperous. On a more personal note, he's a committed Christian. He and his wife, Ursula, have lived in the Alliston area since their marriage 43 years ago. They have five children, 26 grandchildren. He taught Sunday school for many years, served as a missions chair for a number of years, volunteered as a shift supervisor at The Door, which is a teen drop-in center in Alliston, operated by Youth for Christ. He served as an elder at a previous church for many years, was a member of the district executive committee for the Central Canadian District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church for six years, and served on the board of a Christian not-for-profit for a number of years. Currently, he's a member of a house church in the Alliston area. He enjoys reading, history, biographies, and theology, as well as wilderness canoe trips, playing hockey and basketball. Again, uh, Ken, it's a great pleasure to have you here today, and it's been good to be in your house. Uh, I've enjoyed hospitality, you and your wife, Ursula, and uh, it was a pleasure when Elaine and I were able to be with you uh, earlier this year. Anyway, thank you for taking on this role of development director, and how do you see that role uh, in Canada today? Well, it's a, uh, I see one great opportunity is the opportunity to inform Canadians about uh, tremendous information that has been suppressed and forgotten about. And, and that is literally the fact that Christians created Western civilization. Um, the freedom and the prosperity that we have in Canada, the United States, England, you talk about the entire Western world, it came because of Christ, because of biblical principles being applied by Christians. And, and um, because we're the Christian Heritage Party, we have an opportunity to bring that back to people's consciousness. Because right now, of course, the cancel culture is canceling anything to do with Christianity and, and have been successful over <coughs> generations now through our public school system in just suppressing all of this, the fact that our the founders of science were primarily Christian, that uh, virtually all the benevolent organizations on earth were started by Christians. Um, 
the freedoms that we enjoy are there because of Christians. And, um, and it's just an interesting thing about freedom is that the uh, freedom gives those that uh, are opposed to Christianity the opportunity to attack Christianity. And uh, it's like they're sitting on the, on the end of a branch, cutting that branch off the tree, and only to realize when they finally will realize it that it ends in death and destruction. But um, right now we're we're headed down that path, and we desperately need to get back to the root of our freedom, which which is God Himself. Yeah. Well, the Bible says, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." Uh, in the past uh, few months, we put out this brochure, um, had enough cancel culture, it's time to restore culture. And of course, we're, uh, that was an attempt, a little bit of uh, mention of the scriptural references on the Peace Tower and in, in the Parliament buildings, but more importantly, the founders of our nation, uh, Sir Leonard Tilley, uh, who, who uh, in his devotion saw the phrase, you, he shall have dominion from sea to sea. And that's where the, the name, the original name, the dominion of Canada came from. And he wasn't uh, uh, an outlier. He was one of many founders who had a Christian uh, foundation to their faith and that guided their, their discussions. And as a result, we do have a representative democracy. Some people might uh, argue with the words, whether it's uh, a democracy, a, uh, um, it's, it's a representative government anyway, that sometimes democracy can be taken as like mob rule, but um, it's meant to be that the people living in a particular jurisdiction uh, have some say over who is guiding their affairs, who, who, which men and women are entrusted with the duty of writing the laws and, and enforcing the laws. So that's something that we enjoy in Canada. Of course, many places in the world, uh, the people don't have a choice as to who is representing them and their halls of power. They just have to uh, go along with the uh, edicts from, from on high. Um, and you're working on a follow-up uh, brochure. It's uh, far from uh, ready for publication, but you name seven uh, areas where uh, Christians have had uh, either a primary or even the sole um, kind of role in developing. And um, maybe we'll mention those. I'll rattle them off here, maybe not in the same order, and then you can touch on them in a more detail. Modern health care, uh, the recognition of human rights and freedoms, equality for women, education, uh, science and technology, and insurance against loss. I didn't actually know myself that insurance companies were, uh, were the brainchild of a Christian. And checks and balances on government power to keep uh, governments honest, to keep them from becoming uh, institutions of corruption and greed. So anyway, uh, maybe you can uh, fill in a few details on some of these. We won't try to recreate the whole uh, brochure here because that's a work in process, but, but um, you got some details there that you might want to bring out for the folks on this call. Yeah, and um, I might say that I, one of the main sources that I used for this information is a book written by uh, a man by the name of Vishal Mangalwadi. And the name of that book is uh, The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization. And this book is just loaded. It's a treasure trove of things that Christians have done that have made the world a better place to live over the last 2,000 years. And just to um, give you an idea of how good that book is, um, Jordan Peterson uh, I listened to a podcast of Jordan Peterson uh, back about three or four weeks ago. Um, he actually interviewed Vishal Mangalwadi, and he interviewed him apparently because uh, Jordan mentioned that he had read two of Vishal Mangalwadi's books, The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization, as well as another book on the Bible called This Book Changed Everything. And in the podcast, Jordan Peterson 
was uh, very complimentary to Vishal about the way that he was he was so effective in making his points. And uh, they had a lengthy, like it was a two hour podcast of them going back and forth discussing this topic. And um, so I'd highly recommend that for anybody that wants to get into some more detail. And I'd recommend that book as being just an amazing book. Um, so um, is there where, any uh, particular one of those, Rod, where you'd like uh, me to list a bit of detail? Well, uh, education, of course, is a, a topic that we're all concerned with. We're, we're public education for young children, for one thing, and then university education. Uh, where is that leading people? Are, are people actually getting a good education today? I mean, that's maybe that's a, beyond our scope of our discussion, but some of these universities that were uh, founded by Christians, for instance, and I think most people today don't know that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, education on, on any kind of a broad scale came from Christianity. And this is, this is a global event. This is a global reality. And it was Christians who founded universities. And so the, the first universities were founded as Christian institutions. And um, globally, the list includes places like Oxford, Cambridge in the United States, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Northwestern, Columbia, and Brown. In Canada, the list includes the University of Toronto, McMaster, Western, Queens, Concordia, Acadia, Mount Allison, Laval, University of Manitoba, University of Saskatchewan, and St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, all of those universities were started by Christians. And, um, but uh, tragically, over the years, the uh, secular influences gradually took over and to, to the point where now, if, if a person sends their young, uh, young son or daughter off to university to study anything in the social sciences, uh, humanities, uh, they are probably going to be programmed with radically left uh, anti-God perspectives on things. And so the university has become a place where you want to avoid it. Um, uh, I'd say the safest things to study might be engineering, um, where you're dealing with hard physics and math. Uh, but uh, apart from that, it's a very dangerous place to go. And as I'd say, it's even dangerous in those areas because of the pervasive um, pervasiveness of these uh, philosophies. Yeah. And then uh, the whole area of science and technology um, is, you know, we often hear people, well, we, we go with the science, right? Uh, we go with the science. Well, of course, we've heard that in the medical uh, realm, uh, medical, political, <laughs> uh, industrial complex there that we've been living under for the last few years. But in, in science and technology, innovation, research, uh, development, uh, some of the ideas that, that have actually framed our modern scientific world, uh, development of uh, various technologies and, and branches of study. Um, I know the name Isaac Newton is uh, connected uh, as a Christian who, who uh, you know, there, he wasn't in conflict between faith in God and and a uh, an interest in science. Do you have uh, any other names uh, that you have in that category? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gregor Mendel was an Augustinian monk, and he's known as the father of modern genetics. Uh, Copernicus, a fellow by the name of Bray, Kepler, and Galileo made huge contributions in the field of astronomy, and all of them were devout Christians. You've already mentioned... Um, Isaac Newton and his writings reveal a belief in the God of the Bible. Um, other scientists who profess belief in the God of the Bible include Gottfried Leibniz, who was co-developer of the theory of differential calculus, Blaise Pascal, another mathematician, Alessandro Volta, discoverer of current electricity, George Ohm, formulator of the equation that measures electrical resistance, Andre Ampere, whose name is enshrined in the language of electrical measurements. Michael Faraday, discoverer of electromagnetic induction. William Kelvin, founder of thermodynamics. Robert Boyle, who is recognized as the father of chemistry. And John Dalton, who's known as the father of atomic theory. All of these are uh, 
scientists who profess belief in the God of the Bible. And there's there's other scientists in the in the field of medicine. It's uh, it's really um, incredible. And and maybe just one more uh, of all these areas. There there's a lot we could go through, but we're not going to get to it all today. But uh, in terms of uh, modern health care, uh, hospitals and and uh, charitable organizations, you know, uh, compassionate organizations, you you have some names and and um, some direction there that we can focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, I, I, uh, this is just a, amazing when you think about it. But virtually every benevolent organization on earth was started by Christians. Um, and and uh, I'm just thinking here, um, like before the advent of Jesus, so going back 2000 years ago, uh, people were treated, the people who were sick and weak and downtrodden were treated very badly. There's a uh, an historian by the name of Fielding Garrison, who was also a physician and and he said that before the birth of Christ, the spirit towards sickness and misfortune was not one of compassion. And the credit of ministering to human suffering on an extended scale belongs to Christianity. And here's a, here's a really profound comment by Malcolm Muggeridge. Um, people that are listening who are older in years uh, may recognize the name Malcolm Muggeridge. He was a famous individual, grew up as an atheist. His parents were radical socialists. They were Fabian socialists. So he grew up in a very elite, radical socialist environment as a, as a young kid and, and young adult and um, became a, a journalist, spent a lot of time in, in Soviet Russia and uh, ultimately became a Christian. And However, before he became a Christian, one of the things that he noted was that many Christians gave up their comforts and risked their lives to serve the poorest of the poor. And even though he was an atheist at that time, he observed that atheistic humanism had not inspired anyone to devote his or her life to serve the dying destitute of Calcutta. And going back into the... Uh, the, age, the ages, hundreds of years ago, when they had the, the plague going through Europe, it was the Christians that would stay behind and, and look after the sick. The, um, the people who didn't have that faith in God and didn't have that uh, security of knowing that, hey, if I die, I'm going to a better place. So those Christians stayed behind and looked after the sick. And um, that's just a, a hallmark of Christianity. And, and history proves that to be the case. And books like that one I mentioned and there's another book, um, How Christianity Changed the World. Um, it's loaded as well with uh, this kind of information. I don't know. My friend uh, in Edmonton, uh, Vince Byfield, uh, one of the sons of Ted Byfield, is working on a book. I don't think, don't think it'll be out this year. It'll be next year because he's doing it's quite a scholarly work. But it, it will be focused on Christian, uh, you know, uh, contributions to society or impacts on society. Um, so Ken, in your new role, uh, you've been at it a couple of months, development director for the Christian Heritage Party of Canada. I know you are reaching out to uh, young people uh, as well as uh, Christian institutions and organizations uh, with the, the challenging uh, uh, tasks that we have of bringing biblical morality into the public square and and putting it front and center in the middle of our political uh, sort of chaos that we have in our country today. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all, I think Christians and non-Christians alike see our nation sliding into uh, some kind of, somewhere between anarchy and, uh, and uh, dictatorship, or maybe a comb the combination, the worst of the, both those uh, options. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we believe that uh, Christian values, Christian principles, uh, doing unto others as we'd have them do unto us, and, uh, you know, loving our neighbors as, as ourselves, these are the types of things that could possibly uh, bring our country back uh, from the brink of destruction. But anyway, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your vision for uh, inviting 
young people and organizations uh, that want to see change, inviting them to participate uh, with us in in the Christian Heritage Party. Sure. Um, yeah, we uh, we definitely need to uh, take back our country because, to a large degree, our country has been taken away from us, and and um, the it's the young people who are the next generation, and they need to be uh, educated and equipped to uh, be able to take that to take our country back. And and uh, so what I'm doing is I'm reaching out to the the principals of Christian schools. I'm reaching out to professors at some Christian universities. Um, and uh, seeing if I can, uh, if they would be interested in having me come in and do a presentation. I've, I've developed a PowerPoint presentation that is, much of it is focused on going through the amazing, incredible accomplishments. We've just touched on the very tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg <laughs> of, of some of those accomplishments. I mean, it's just incredible. And um, it's just, that's why, I, that's why my suggestion for that brochure is uh, Christianity's seven best kept secrets. I mean, that, those are seven out of about 7,000 accomplishments. And um, uh, so I've uh, been phoning and sending emails. Um, I've had a couple of Christian school principals respond to me and express interest. So we're just in the early stages of working our way into developing, having a meeting and seeing where things go from there. Um, I, uh, been in touch. I've had responses from a couple of professors at a couple of different Christian seminaries where uh, there's been an interest expressed. And um, one of those professors I'll be having coffee with in August to talk about where we might go. Um, so it's, uh, it's very much uh, developing relationships and exploring that. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping I can get in. And, and, and a point I'd like to make about like uh, I like this is my personal view is that we it's going to take a a real revival a great awakening uh, a great spiritual revival a great turning to God a repentance for our materialism our love of entertainment and comfort and this is the kind of thing that Israel fell prey to over and over and over again God you know God would bless them they would become prosperous and then they'd forget about God and they'd be oriented to the things that God gave them instead of God. And um, we need to get back there. And uh, um, I, just to give an example of where we've strayed from, I was reading the other day that about 250 years ago, the, they had little schoolhouses in the United States and they had three textbooks in their schoolhouses. They had a Bible, they had a hymnal, and they had the New England Primer. And the New England Primer started off with A is for Adam. And then it told a bit about Adam. B is for the Bible. And then it would tell a bit about the Bible. C is for Christ. Then it tells a bit about Christ. And on and on. So the New England Primer was just saturated with the Bible. And they used that for teaching their kids uh, the alphabet and how to read and write. And so is it any wonder that the United States quickly grew to become the uh, most prosperous, strongest nation in the world. And, and we have eroded, oh, tragically, we've eroded so much from that kind of a biblical orientation to where now, even in Christian homes, like so little time is spent studying the scriptures that is it any wonder that so many kids that grow up in a church going home once they get off and leave the house, they, they leave the faith and they're off. Uh, so we, we have a lot of work to do to, to take back uh, the ground that our forefathers gained. Well, and I think, uh, you know, for, for our listeners who may not be Bible-believing uh, Christians or haven't, haven't uh, set their steps to, uh, to follow biblical teachings, but I think, you know, what what we want to communicate is that these principles laid out in the Bible are good for everybody. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not uh, laid out to make life easy for Christians and hard for non-Christians. Uh, if, if we had, exactly. if we had honest politicians, politicians who were looking over their shoulders saying, God's watching what I'm doing. And uh, I can't put my hand in a cookie jar and uh, take people's taxpayer money and throw it away. I can't uh, 
you know, exert um, dictatorial powers over the citizens of, of Canada because God's watching and he wants me to treat people the way I want to be treated, right? And yep. if, if, uh, if we could have the confidence that our politicians were looking at life in a uh, self-sacrificing way, not in a self-serving manner, then I think um, we'd have a lot more confidence uh, in, you know, the progress of, of our country. We've, we've seen so many people, families and uh, churches and businesses devastated over the past couple of years. Uh, with the uh, COVID lockdowns, the mandates, and so on. And uh, there hasn't even been that, uh, uh, you know, the politeness, the, the civility of, of a government to even talk to the people and say, so, um, you know, this is what we're planning to do, but what do you folks think? Actually, you guys, you uh, citizens are, are the ones who... Um, control the government. We, we serve you, not, not uh, you're not our slaves. We, the government, serve you. That's, that's the kind of um, servants we want to see in the halls of power. And Absolutely. so, um, but it's, sometimes it's difficult. Some people think that uh, we as Christians want to impose our will on, on non-believers or want to, you know, force everyone to believe certain things. And that's, that's not the case at all. We just want to set a standard that will be good for everybody. And we believe those standards are found in the Bible. Yeah, Rod, that's a, a great point about everybody has benefited regardless of their religious beliefs. And, and everybody is religious. I mean, somebody who's an atheist, they're religious. I mean, all religion is, is a set of beliefs that you live by. And so everybody is a religious person. And uh, uh, my hope is that There'll be a there'll be a, some open-minded people who aren't Christians that uh, will be intrigued by hearing about these accomplishments of Christians and will explore it further. Um, and you know when people realize that their health care, the the uh, homes for looking after the aged, for an orphanages, for leper colonies, for the the organizations like Red Cross was started by Christians. The, YMCA and YWCA, the United Way, the Children's Aid Society, all were started by Christians. And um, uh, the Magna Carta was brokered by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Like, um, and the, the freedom, the principles in the Magna Carta, which is one of the building blocks of our free Western society, that was uh, based on biblical principles. And so for a non-Christian to go through and realize, wow, like my health care uh, the rights and freedoms that I, my freedom of speech, uh, my freedom to assemble freely with friends or whoever, um, the fact that women are treated as equals came from Christianity, and and his, history shows that. And, and in fact, anybody who travels today leaves Canada and goes to a country where there's no Christianity or where uh, there hasn't been Christianity for a long, long time, you quickly will see that women are treated very poorly. And um, but in anywhere where Christianity is dominant or recently has been dominant, women are treated with respect and dignity. Um, when they see that there's less corruption in countries that are uh, have, are strongly influenced by the Bible, when they see that education, like the opportunity to get educated was provided by Christians, that we have this great scientific discoveries that we have because of Christians. So an objective non-Christian, if they're wise, they'd sit back and think, okay, well, I don't even have to become a Christian, I, if, but it makes sense to have these people governing our country, um, and because look at what has happened in the past when Christians have governed the land. Um, we've had unprecedented prosperity and freedom. <clears throat> you go back before Christ, and almost every part of the earth was under some form of tyranny and oppression, um, and it was only after Jesus came <clears throat> that freedom spread around the world into those countries where missionaries went and spread the gospel. So um, anyway, these, they're just amazing information that uh, hopefully is going to cause some people to have a much greater appreciation for the benefits of Christianity. Yeah, very good. And it's only really since, since uh, Christianity has been basically rejected from the public square, either by the courts or 
or uh, legislators um, that that we've had some of the uh, catastrophic events taking place in our society in terms of, uh, you know, broken homes, in terms of, uh, you know, drug abuse and uh, overuse, uh, violence in the streets, uh, and just the lack of trust that we have between one and, you know, uh, between our neighbors and uh, between us and the government. So, uh, Ken, if people want to participate, we're obviously, as a political party, uh, we're always looking for candidates. We're looking for people who want to help us build in different areas. You're the development director. So uh, people, you are in contact with people. You are helping people start new uh, electoral district associations where we have not had them in the past. And certainly we are interested in in reaching out to uh, areas, people groups, uh, provinces where we have not uh, in the past had had a strong representation. Uh, how can people get a hold of you and, and begin to have a discussion with you about starting something in their area? Sure. Well, I'll give you my uh, my office phone number, which is 416-945-9171. That's 416-945-9171. Or they could email me at developmentdirector at chp.ca. Developmentdirector at chp.ca. I would welcome, definitely welcome conversations with people who are interested in helping out, interested potentially in becoming a candidate or, um, or how they could help with the CHP. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing, Ken. I'm really excited about this project you're working on. Uh, this brochure and and the you know sort of the background to it we'll have a landing page uh, eventually with that information and um, and you've got this great PowerPoint presentation that you have been sharing with people in different areas and thank you for the work you're doing we appreciate it and uh, God bless you take care great thing yeah thanks a lot Ron yeah. And tune in again next week, folks, for another edition of CHP Talks.